The squash court where you're about to go or a changing room they used to use for the physio which wasn't ideal, you can imagine it was a bit uh, open so we've, uh, you'll see our office later, we've moved up to a little bit more of a bigger open plan office and uh, so down here now is where it all happens, it's in and around where the changing rooms are which is right by them toilets where we're standing so it's the hub of all activity isn't it Dougie? Yeah it is. All the players um, come and uh, tell Dougie all the, all the stories, all the stories and, yeah. and um, what's going on so Dougie feeds it down. It's the best way of finding out the <laughs> things going on in players personal lives, always for the physio. <laughs> because, uh, you'll always hear a bit of banter going on in here and then Dougie will say, did you know that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no I didn't. Yeah. And, uh, there's always something going on. Always something. Because this room is always a hub of activity yeah. and because like you have to have good banter to be in here, yeah. like me, Re, Chris, got a great banner. <laughs> um, I'm now just getting everything. When we go to training ground at uh, Woody's, I have to go and watch training every day to make sure someone is down there in case anything happens. So every day I take um, physio equipment, strappings, and in this bag, whilst you're here, I'll just show you what's in it. We take two lots to the training ground every day. Um, so that bag was strapping and physio equipment, and this bag, we have the defib, we have the fat pack, um, just general first aid bag and boot. And I'll also take um, Entodox, which is uh, laughing gas. And yeah. um, we'll take it with us. So every day we're, we're always like fully stocked and ready for anything. You had a bad left leg right yeah. the training field and stuff. So you, you need to make sure. So this comes with me every day. So sure I'm just now getting that. ready to go down there, hence coat, boots. <laughs> um, I don't like the cold. Um, so yeah. Jay, Jay does a warm up for 20 minutes, just over 20 minutes. The studio has a bit of grace between 11 and 11 20. If, if Jay gets someone injured in a warm up, something's, something's seriously wrong. Uh, okay, good. <coughs> what we do, that, that board over there, um, that's where we put all the information up. So if we're travelling at the weekend, everything, the squad, the time where they're meeting, everything's written on a board. So if a player comes in and says, Oh, I wasn't there when you said it, or I didn't hear it. You always say, check the board before you leave, you check the board so you know where you've got to be at what time. And them stats I showed you earlier, we were putting them up for the players. Um, so you look here, just putting things like when we played Burton and we won 3 1, we won seven of the key areas, they didn't win any. Um, so you go through them all. You have to win, etc. So we've given the boys stuff, they'd always come in and have a look at it to see how they've got on in the stats. Uh, some information. Good. Even the staff have started coming in here now after training. It's coming to the quiet Christmas. And I'm going to just talk about these little bits here, analysis, wellness, and our training schedule philosophy, which we've, we've got on here, which I'll, I'll bring up on, on this now. Good. So, that's not come up yet. Good. So this... Anyway, if you, can, you might not be able to see too much of this. This is a, a standard report that Jay does on his laptop. Um, it's got the name of all the players along there and he goes from the way along different months. Um, but basically it's got questions. I slept well last night. I'm looking forward to today's training session. I'm off now. I feel vigorous, energetic, refreshed. It's got loads of different questions in the top part. And the players out of five will put strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree or strongly agree. Fairly basic, fairly simple. But as it goes down and you go down the bottom bit, which says, I had a good breakfast, I, I slept well, etc., etc., it goes through a load list of questions, it brings out a score at the end. Most of them will be about in a middle zone, but you might get some that particularly are, are lower. And they're the ones that Jay will mark out, and he'll always come in to me and say, Look, keep an eye on these two, their, their reports didn't come in very well, um, etc., etc., and it just gives us a, a guide. And that takes Half an hour in the morning, each player just spends three or four minutes just yeah. inputting their scores. And they know the importance of it. They know that this is there for them. This is there to help us, to help them to stay fit throughout the season. Because if they don't, then it's them that's out of the team if they don't do it right. <clears throat> and on that, here Jay does me a, a monthly um, report on each player. Um, now, within this, you can get caught up with loads of data and not much really really good information but one thing we've we've come to the thing you won't be able to see it it's, it's in there but basically in here we've worked out what over the course of each session should be 
should be the, the zones they're hitting on their heart rates. So for argument's sake, if they're hitting at 95% of their maximum plus, that's their really dynamic work. That's Michael Smith sprinting in behind defenders, you know, that, that's the flat out type, type of stuff. Now, in training, the whole point of all of this is to train their bodies for what we want them to do on a Saturday. So what's been really useful with this is if we feel to the naked eye players haven't been at it in training, their intensity hasn't been good enough, <clears throat> we go back for our reports. And we look at the average of the squad, we look at where they should be, and a lot of the time it does match up. You know, and again, Michael Smith was one of them, Callum Kennedy was one before, um, Jack Mitson early season was one, where they were well below where their peers in our squad and where the average was. And we showed them the heart rates. Listen, this is how often you get into these dynamic zones. This is how hard you push yourself in training. Now, Callum Kennedy and Michael Smith every week go and see Jason Moriarty and say, can I have my stats? Because they want to see whether they've trained right or not. And it's brilliant because Michael Smith in particular, he went through a sticky spell where you looked and thought, well, maybe he's 21, maybe it's caught up with him a little bit. But when we actually looked at his training report, he was training poorly. And you know, we're big believers, we say you train as you play. If you don't, your body will adapt to every training regime you put in. If you don't train your body, when you go on a Saturday and we say we want you stretching things, we want you running beyond, we want you pressing from the front, we want you recovering quick, they're gonna go, I can't do it. Well you can't do it because you're not training your body to every day. And the, the brilliant part about it is the players are bought into this now. They actually know, listen, if I do this right on Saturday, that takes care of itself. I feel great. And actually mentally I go, I've trained brilliantly this week because I've seen the stats. And you actually go in on Saturday going, I can make that run because I know I can get back because I know I've trained my body to. So it's a, it's a great tool. It's a good tool for us to mark flag up <coughs> one that's not doing it properly. But it's a great tool because the players are actually buying into it, which, as we all know, is half the battle. So <coughs> that's, um, that's the wellness report in there. Um, I've got up on the list there about match analysis. Um, bring up now. We have every game, we have, um, I don't think you can see the stats, we have um, the games analysed. Uh, so on here, this is our game against Portsmouth. I chose a nice one that we won 4 0 in. I didn't bother showing you Saturday's game. Um, and again, just gives us some stats that we get collected by our guy who analyses. The top one's obviously goals. We have total shots, shots on target, shots off. Then we have blocks. We have clear cut chances, which is a big thing that normal stats don't show you. You know, it might show you that the opposition had 12 shots on goal, we had seven. You might think, oh, they were better than us on today. But all their shots might have been from 35, 40 yards and gone over. When you look at clear cut chances, and clear cut's one where you think that was a good chance to score, whether it was in the box or someone having a chance to get a shot off, it was a good chance to score. That's a clear one. We had seven, they only had two. Um, we have underneath passes attempted, and there's a reason for, for showing that. And, and about three underneath that, it has five and third entries. Now the two marry up against Millwall early in the season. We had as many passes, if not more, than Millwall, but they had twice as many final third entries. So that tells you that we passed nowhere. We went backwards, we went sideways, we didn't really go anywhere, and it, it was everything that I thought on the day. Millwall were a lot more effective with their passing. So you can look at your passes and your completion rate and say, oh, we had 82%, they passed a bit more than us, but we had a lot more final third entries. Down the bottom it says penetrating runs. You can't, you can't stretch teams, you can't pass the ball if you're not penetrating. And that's not runs where actual players receive it, that's runs where you can see people making the run. Uh, because by if you keep doing that, their defence will naturally drop a bit deeper, you're having more space. We've got number of striker holds ups, which is three from the bottom, and percentage of striker hold ups. One big thing in football is if, you, if your strikers can get, can get hold of the ball, you're going to have a platform to play from. So from our defensive side, are their strikers bullying us, getting hold of it and playing? Are we not doing our jobs there? And at the other end, is Michael Smith getting hold of it? Have we got a platform to play for? If he's not, is it the quality into him that we need to look at? And so on and so forth. So there's, there's elements there which we class as crosses in there. From just below midway, uh, we've got 10 and we've got 6. And it breaks it down into 30s, so you can see whether you started well, whether you had a stick spell in the middle, etc, etc. And we call these the key stats. Um, and when you might see when you go down and have a look at the gym, early season particularly, if we won most of these key stats, I think it was about seven that we classed as key stats, if we won five out of seven, we won the game. As it's gone on, the stats have started to turn a little bit, where you know, we won five and lost the game, 
the opposition have won four and we've only won three and we've won the game so it's turned a little bit it's not uh, an exact science because obviously as we know both boxes are the most important part of the pitch and, and again the players actually have started buying into it it's asking them, what was the stats on Saturday's game you know, it felt like we were the better team etc etc football is stats as much as we uh, we want it to be the beautiful game it is stats how often you going to get into the mirrors there's different ways of getting there and that's what we work on but uh, how we're going to get on and another one we start with right now is how many crosses we get first contact on in both boxes which I'll show you a couple of things this is how in depth the guy is doing rather than take here these are crosses that we've had in the game and what it basically says is we had 10 crosses in the game 1 to 10 what minute it was in the area the ball was won, which I'll show you in a minute, number of passes that led to the cross, what area it, it fell in, and I'll show you the game as I'm being A for B, and what happened, cleared by the defender, flashed across the goal, and so on and so forth. So we can look through that and go, headed clear, cleared by the defender, controlled by the attacker, cleared by the defender, and we can go, well, we only actually got first contact on three out of the ten crosses, but that's not good enough. And it might give us a trend where we go, right, Bash, you take the centre forwards, and I want you to make sure their movement's better to get on the end of the crosses, because it's plainly obvious the stats are telling us. Not. So it, it's got to be there to be used, and not just uh, generally. Um, <coughs> and again, there's the zone, so the areas the ball might have been won, but we won it in four going that way. You know, where did we press, where did we win the ball back to get our crossing? Is there a theme? You know, throughout the games that we, if we win the ball in their half more, we end up with more attempts on goal, okay, brilliant, but let's work harder at winning the ball in their half more, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's areas like that. And where the crosses have landed, you know, you saw A3, A B4, so on and so forth. So we can see, obviously, B3 is probably the area we most want to hit, because we talk about trying to get our crosses in that second six-yard box there where the penalty's put in anything in the six yard, you have a chance of a goalkeeper coming and claiming, so we try and time our runs and our crosses to, for them to end up in that area. So it gives us some stats on, on that kind of stuff. This one here is passing stats, so we look at our passing stats, that's the pitch, where we had our passes, what percentage of them were successful, you know, and it gives you a guide sometimes to say, well, we worked, so this was Portsmouth, and having brought Kaid Mohammed in, um, all of a sudden we felt instead of attacking down the right a lot more, which is this side, we only had 79% going down the right and 62 passes, we had 88 down that left hand side and a lot more percentage. So we actually attacked down the left a lot more than we had previously, which was something that we felt we needed to bring Kaid Mohammed in for to give us that outlet of pace the other side to take a little bit of the weight off of maybe George Porter down one side. And it, on that particular game, it was, and I don't know if you can remember the Portsmouth awesome game, I remember it and thought we were strong down the left in particular that game. We had a quiet game, which maybe these stats tell you. Um, it is. But, I mean, it's all the information. <coughs> they work hard, the analysis team, they get them to us by Sunday night, and when we forward them on to Eric, Sunday night, I really like speakers. <laughs> so, for him to have a good look at. Um, How many people do that? This is, um, there's two people. There's one called Stephen. We bought, last season, we bought a camera. Club bought a camera, tripod and widescreen so that we could get our footage wider so we can see. I don't want it like a TV where we're on someone's back we want to be able to go, well, why, why is he not tucked in there? We want to be able to see the picture. Um, and he films it and then on the way home the coach he tags it. Um, and then there's another guy called James Scott who works with the academy and between them they make sure that they, they with their tagging and stuff they deliver these stats to me on a Sunday night which is brilliant. Um, and we get two DVDs, one full game copy and one of clips. So after the game, Stephen will say to me, is there anything particularly you want clipped? Um, and I might say, second balls, we didn't win enough second balls, I need to see that. And if you can show me all the clips, I might end up showing the players it, just on the clips rather than finding everyone myself. Um, normally we do their strikers hold-ups, our strikers hold-ups, chances, crosses, balls in behind. So it's great for our strikers, I give them to Michael Smith and there's a section on strikers. So there you go. You watch that, that'll have clips of nearly every time he's involved in the game. And you can watch that clips. And they do, they come in and ask for DVDs nowadays, which is what you want them to do. You want them to look and go, I can see what the manager's saying now. I didn't run him behind or I did run him behind or whatnot. Last season, I think, you know, what we did was 
towards the back end, the last six to eight weeks of the season, we actually went more three day weeks than we did less. So we ended up giving them Sunday, Monday and Wednesdays off, but we had really hard doubles Tuesday and then trained Thursday, Friday and prepped for the game. And uh, the reason for that was because we all knew the situation we were under and there was a lot of pressure on them. So it was a case of coming in only three days, working really, really hard for them three days, but giving them a lot of time away to get ready for what was the last two or three months of the season. Just about worked. <laughs> Do you practice um, We, the last four weeks, I've, I've absolutely as much as I can. I mean, Benno cost us the goal on Saturday at Bristol. He said, and Ross, because Ross was going to come for the cross, that where that stand was, the sun was in their eyes. They literally couldn't see the ball. And I said, well, their player saw it well enough to win it. You know, I'd like to see, I'd like to hear him to say how, how, work out how he saw the ball. But Benno isn't really an excuse, man. No, you know, he wouldn't think he was. And he just said, I lost the ball in the sun. Their guy didn't, and, and ultimately scored the goal. Um, but we practice ours regularly and what we actually did, we, we used to have probably four different corners. But it got to the point where I went, listen, we're just going to do two. For, for a spell we're going to do two because I don't think they can take in the information of when to do what. And it's all relative to, if they set up this way, do this corner. They set up that way, but they're not, when the game's going on, they can't look and go, oh, it's that corner. And then <clears throat> the one taking it might see it, but the others all line up for a different one. So in the end, I just went, let's just do two corners, not confuse them, and focus on the quality of them corners. And we have, we do, we did probably half an hour at the end of every Thursday. And then we'll do another 10 minutes on a Friday before we go into the defending ones to recap it. So everyone knows there. Team up to get something out of it that you want. So again, this is about switching play. So it's no good having a formation for each team that only end up with one wide player. So here you need to have Barry as a fullback and Kevin as a wide player because them two need to work together to try and unlock the key down one side of the pitch. Um, only having they have, the, both teams will be in a 3 3 2 formation. So Barry will have to tuck in to cover Ben, which you'd have to do naturally in the game. But he's also got to be aware that if they switch playing with the other side, they're going to get across it. Yes, 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 yes,
Just ask what the main purpose of this session is. This is um, defending crosses and defending our half of the pitch. So the idea is that the opposition are working to try and get crosses in, and we're making sure we defend them properly. Players know what positions to take up at what time, and and then when they win the ball, can they get the passes in and break out? Is so this a regular thing at most days? It, it, it will be something that we we do at least once a week. We'll split them and we'll work on, there'll be a defensive element, we'll go off with Coxie. And again, one constant I try and do with my coaches is Coxie generally will work on defending um, and back four stuff and midfield and Bass will work at attacking. So they keep the same voice, the same theme going constantly through the season. Joining me now, I'm delighted to say, is Blue and Yellow Club co-founder and vice president, Ian McNay. We've been behind the scenes earlier this week uh, with the first team and Neil Ardley one of the benefits of the club. Just tell us overall what the benefits of this club are for supporters who want to get involved. We started the Blue and Yellow Club in the summer of 2012 and the whole idea was to raise extra money for Neil Ardley's playing budget because we all know we have a fairly low budget for League Two and we needed to increase that budget. And the idea was supporters that have a bit more than the average supporter and able to afford a thousand pound a year, we pay that per season and get special benefits and we have blue membership and yellow membership and the blue membership is for people that are basically season ticket holders pretty much come to all the matches and they get um, two dinners a year with the two Neils and it's in a private dining room in, in a very good restaurant in Wimbledon and you can ask pretty much any question you want you can even ask why he substituted a player on Saturday in the 62nd minute and brought somebody else on when you thought it was the wrong decision, you can ask him and Neil Ardy will tell you why he did it and there's always insight there and it's very interesting, we learn more and more about how his mind works and how his tactics work and how his thinking works and how he is and he also learns as he's going along, he explains all this process. So uh, you have that twice a year, two dinners with, with, with the two Neils, you get access to the President's Lounge before and after matches. We just had last week a small visit by Blue and Yellow Club members to the training ground. Again, where Neil did an introduction, explained how the players are going to do the training that day, and then you watch them train, and he explains various things. Which, if you're interested in that, and don't mind standing in the cold for a couple of hours, is, is, is quite fascinating. You also get two tickets to the uh, end, of season, end of season dinner, um, I've got my little list here, so I include everything here. Oh yes, and we also meet in the carvery. Uh, some of us before games, we have a table there, and we get to know each other, and some of us even travel to away games together. So it's a partly a social thing as well. Now the yellow members, they're the people that maybe don't come to many games because they live far away from, from Wimbledon and Kingston. So they, they just get... They still get access to the dinners and other things, but they also get to be treated as real VIPs to two games a year with a guest. And there, um, they come to the carvery first. They get 
they get a, a ticket in the uh, director's box, they're really looked after, they get to meet obviously Eric and Neil, anyone else they want to meet, and they have a very special day out with their friends. So that's one of the benefits of the, of the yellow membership. And again, we try and introduce them to other blue and yellow club members, and it becomes, becomes a social thing. And sometimes we can get, if, if there's space, we can even get the yellow members into a boardroom at an away game far away if, if, if there's space. So that's the idea. You get some benefits. At the end of the day, there are benefits that don't co cost the club very much money at all because the whole idea is to raise money for the playing budget. And last year, we did a special appeal in January to get some extra money in to help buy Harry Pell. And altogether last year, we, we raised £34,000 for the playing budget, which I know the two Neils really appreciate.